Okay. So uh, today we are talking with the candidates for Metro District District Three. Um, what, and uh, I thought we would just start off by having each of you give just like a minute or two introduction about who you are, why you're running, and why you think you're the best candidate for this position. Um, so, uh, Tom, would you mind going first? I'm Tom Anderson. Um, I've been on the uh, Tiger City Council for the last four years. Um, Craig Dirksen approached me when he was uh, thinking about retiring and uh, wanted to have a smooth transition. And he was going to endorse me when he uh, uh, told everybody that he wasn't running again, basically. So um, that's the case. We talked it over. My strengths in uh, land use planning, I was the president of the Tiger Planning Commission for seven years. And um, we dealt a lot with the urban growth boundary that Metro um, enforces. And, uh, and the transportation, of course, the uh, Southwest Corridor Project, uh, City Council is very involved with that. So those two strengths, uh, he wanted me to have them on there. And I thought um, this was a great opportunity for me personally to uh, get a little more regional support for the city of Tigard and, and this whole Southwest Washington County that I call home. And Patricia? Uh, okay, my name is Patricia Kepler. Um, so my history, uh, I've been actually a volunteer of Metro uh, for different projects, uh, Parks and Nature, um, and I've actually been very active in the Tri-County area regarding transportation specifically, serving on TriMet's Committee on Accessible Transportation since 2010. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, and just as part of my career uh, from where I've worked in the past and even where I work now at Portland Community College, my focus has been about inclusion and building community. And there's just so many people that get left out <laughs> um, when it comes to Metro. And um, just in my work in this last three years, I've been uh, on the uh, Metro's Committee on Racial Equity and getting a closer look I just felt like it was time that there was some representation of, of marginalized uh, communities on Metro. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so first question, and I figure that we'll just kind of uh, bounce back and forth in terms of who goes first. Um, so let's start with Patricia. Um, Metro announced last month that it is laying off 40% of its staff. Um, and due to lower garbage revenue and the closures of its event venues, um, its revenue has dropped by more than $11 million a month. If you were on the council right now, what other actions would you take to position Metro to get through this economic crisis? Sorry about that. Um, it's a really good question. Um, we were actually, the, the uh, core was actually just talking to them to uh, Metro the other day because they are considering another round of layoffs and they were wanting to make sure that it's equitable. Um, it's all very sad and hopefully it's going to resolve itself, um, you know, in the when this is over and, and we get people back into those venues. Um, but honestly, <laughs> I'm just trying to think honestly here to answer that question. Um, I, I honestly got, I'd have to give that some more thought. I mean, because it's 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 still kind of in this crisis mode, um, wanting to preserve the services and get people back there, possibly. But we need to make sure you know we're all safe first. Um, okay, great, thank you, um, Tom. Same question for you. Um, just in terms of Metro's. Uh, the actions it's taken recently in terms of laying off 40% of its staff and that revenue is down by $11 million a month. Um, if you were in the council, what actions would you take to position the agency to get through this crisis? Well, I think the layoffs were needed. Um, a lot of those were uh, uh, full-time, but temporary full-time people, right? Uh, the services of Metro include the zoo and the convention center and the expo center. Uh, 
Portland's uh, five centers for the arts. Um, those things will, will come back um, when uh, we get the stay at home order lifted. So I think we just need to be ready. Um, I don't think there's anything more than layoffs that they can do for revenue. Um, garbage and recycling will um, will come back up once the commercial uh, venues like the restaurants come back. So I think we just have to wade through it. Okay. Um, kind of building off of that, um, is there anything that or any role that Metro should take uh, in helping the regional economy rebuild? Are there any um, specific areas that you could see Metro going into to uh, kind of help area businesses or, uh, or residents get through this? And Tom, I guess. Well, sure, I'll go first. Um, of course, the federal government has a plan. The state has a plan. Uh, Tigard has recently enacted Tigard Cares plan. Uh, Metro could do something similar for the businesses. Um, most most affected are the service businesses, obviously the restaurants. Um, there could be some kind of a, a low interest loan to some of those folks that don't qualify for um, small business association lending practices. Um, some of these don't make $500,000 a year. So uh, they aren't applying for that kind of grant. Um, so, so we could make some grants available. Um, Metro does have probably a little money in their budget for that as well. So uh, that's the only thing partnering with the cities, of course, because the cities are doing the majority. Portland's got their own uh, Portland cares as well. Um, again, just uh, letting people know that we will hire them back as soon as the stay-at-home order is lifted. Okay, great. Um, Patricia, how about you? Are there any, um, do you think that Metro can or should play a role in helping the overall economy rebuild? Um, and if so, what are some of the, the ideas you might have on that? Um, well, I mean, they are interconnected with you know, the city. So, I mean, I do think they need to be at the table and discussing and discussing all of the, the options that are out there. Um, one, of the, one of the pieces that has been very concerning to me with Metro specifically is um, a, lot of, uh, the, a lot of their uh, services, like at the zoo, ben, are, is, are mostly done by vendors these days. So I would like to see them develop some way of supporting the vendors that have been out of work because they're, they're going to be struggling. They don't have the union that Metro employees do. Um, as with the layoff, what Metro has agreed to is to at least continue covering uh, their employees' uh, health insurance. So they're covered with health insurance through July, I believe. But the vendors have been kind of abandoned. So I would like to see them take an act, a, a stronger role in supporting them. Great. Um, I wanted to see if uh, the others, uh, other board members want to, to jump in with any questions. Amy or Laura? Yeah, or? yeah I, I've got a question. I'm just curious um, with all that's going on now and how this will impact so many different communities, do you believe that Metro should proceed with the transportation measure this year? And if so, would you recommend scaling that back to be less than a $7 billion measure? And that would go first to Patricia. Thank you. Um, that's a very good question. I mean, like I said, transportation I think is key, especially with so many um, of Portland's uh, lower income uh, citizens being forced out of Portland as it is. They've been pushed further and further into those outlying areas where there isn't good transportation. Uh, and they need to get to their jobs. <laughs> so the Southwest Corridor Project connects people, you know, to some of those outlying areas as well as to the college. Um, so I think it's important. Uh, there are some pieces of it that concern me and, and maybe there's some room for, for some tightening on that budget um but you know it, it would be as 
it would be something I'd want to reduce as little as possible. I do think it's an important piece to keep. And Tom? Well, I think uh, things will look much different come November. Um, I, they've been working on this transportation bill for as long as I've been on council, even planning commission, so, you know, six, seven years. I think, I think the transportation bill should be on the November ballot. Um, the homeless services measure on the May ballots, I think they could postpone that. Um, that was, that came rather fast as it was. And uh, so that one, I think that they could postpone. Um, but the transportation bill, the Southwest Corridor is the biggest chunk of it. They've been working on it for a long time and they have some federal money um, that they're trying to attract with that. Uh, matching grants that will expire if they push it out too too much further. So um, I think I think in November the uh, T2020 should go ahead. And at this, uh, at this point, I mean, who knows what's what's going to change? And are there any um, specific funding mechanisms that you would favor um, for the the transportation measure? I know that the uh, there's been talk about a payroll tax. Uh, license registration, also a higher earners tax, which is what they're similarly uh, looking at for homeless, the homeless me measure. Um, are there certain types of funding mechanisms that you think make more sense or are, uh, I guess, more um, likely to be to succeed? Well, I think the license tax um, is probably uh, the highest. I, I think everything is on the table. Uh, they're really trying to find some money. They're trying to cut as well. I know TriMet's trying to cut and and get that number down. I think that would probably be the the most helpful. But um, payroll tax probably my my least favorite, but the license tax would probably be one. There's also a trip tax um, that the state is is trying to work out. Um, so. Um, we still have to work with the state to get some funding from them because they're going to get some funding. All the counties will get some funding. I know uh, Washington County is going to, you know, fund $75 million. So if they can find some money as well. And Patricia, I have a funding question. Is there um, a certain mechanism or uh, a few mechanisms that you would favor? Um. I honestly couldn't answer different from Tom. I think we're pretty much on the same page with that. And I also have to agree about the, um, I didn't mention that before, the um, homelessness bill that's uh, scheduled for May. Uh, it was rushed. Uh, there wasn't a lot of thought. And there's a lot of concern about the impact on many people. So I would, I would also agree to hold off on that. Um, okay. And Amy, did you want to jump in? Sure, if I can remember to unmute, sure. So there's a recurring argument about whether Metro has been too tight-fisted in expanding the urban growth boundary. And some folks or critics are saying, you know, that's hurt housing affordability across the region. So what's your view on Metro's handling of past UGB expansions? And would you have made different decisions? And I believe that goes first to Patricia this time. Oh, well, sure. Okay. You know, what's interesting is that um, people on the east side, they don't know what the urban growth boundary is. <laughs> the people on the west side think Metro is that horrible, mean place with the urban growth boundary. Um, but I, I do think it's time they expanded it um, because housing costs have, they've just gone it's out of control. I mean, people are being forced out of the area. Um, you know, living out here uh, in, out in the Aloha area, I mean, you know, we do have a little bit more space than other areas and I enjoy our green spaces, but I also we need to balance that with the needs of our community and people need affordable housing. And not just low income apartments, but people need to be able to afford to buy a home. They need to be able to actually invest in the community. And Tom? I think they have been pretty tight fisted. Um, but I think here's the deal. 
Metro requires cities to have a plan in place um, for their infrastructure before they'll allow them to expand their boundaries, which is sound and reasonable. The fact is that the cities can't afford these. These are very expensive plans, um, anywhere from $200,000 to $2 million just for the planning stage. And the staffs really just don't have that, that capacity. Um, so Metro has given uh, grants for staffs. Um, for example, King City just got a grant for their planning. So these cities should be actively planning right now. And with the resources, it's tough to do. So it's kind of a chicken or the egg type of situation, which comes first. So if they could get low income loans for the planning um, beforehand, they can add some staff or consultants, however they want to do it, to plan for those regions so they have water and uh, roads, all that infrastructure in place when uh, Metro says that they can come into the urban growth boundary and then the builders, the builders want to build yesterday. So they want to come in uh, when the plan is, is uh, given the thumbs up and, and start building right away. Uh, so we, gotta, we have to slow them down, but we have to um, get the cities um, up to uh, their planning capabilities. There are areas, of course, Clackamas County, Lake Oswego, the Stafford Road area, Tigers expanding, Hillsboro, Forest Grove. I mean, they're certainly mostly on the west side, but Boring, Damascus, all those areas are on the table as well. Great. Um, let's see. So, you know, we, we talked a little bit earlier about, or both of you mentioned the, the homelessness measure, and, and I will note that it's actually too late to pull it from the ballot now. Um, but, you know, one question I have is, you know, it makes almost no commitments to voters about how many people will be served, how that money will be spent, or even who's going to be collecting it. Um, assuming this passes, how would you evaluate whether it's adequately delivering to voters what it should be. And Tom, if, if you can go first on this one. Well, there's um, roughly 15,000 homeless that they've identified in the Portland metro area. So those people, the only success that we can see is if those people get homes and they get off the streets. But the, the measure is so large, 250 million a year for 10 years, that's $2.5 billion for less than it's, it's about 0.6% of the Portland metro area at 15,000. So we could literally give them, and these are conservative numbers, like $13,000 a piece for all the homeless that we have here a year for 10 years. And that's not even dealing with the affordable housing bill that they just passed for the, for the, um, for the multifamily housing. So it's, a, it's just a huge bill. Um, success. Well, we're going to have to support a lot of the nonprofits that are doing the business right now. Uh, I'm sure there will be a lot coming into the area from out of state, out of the area that will uh, try to uh, help with these uh, mental health services. Um, I'm all for the mental health services. I just think it's a little high and it's going to be very tough without their parameters to see if it's a success or not. And Patricia, how about you, um, kind of with, with, as Tom or the lack of parameters, how would you evaluate whether this measure, assuming it passes, um, meets benchmarks of, of success? Um, it's a very good question. Um, and, and, you know, the, um, as far as mental health services, I'm just going to touch on that really quickly with Tom. We've been denying our community so much of that for, I mean, I've worked in the disability field and, and have worked directly with these homeless people who are experienced, excuse me, I did not mute my phone. No problem. Um, worked, uh, worked directly uh, with people with mental health issues that are homeless, their fears of the shelters, their, it's, it's, and I want to see them, 
I want to see a, a program that's going to be successful and help them. So it's something that's very personal to me. Um, but finding a way, finding services that are going to meet their needs um, and not trigger, uh, you know, more negative responses is very important. But also we need to balance that with, uh, like I said, there's some concern about the, the, the taxing and, and it's ag increasingly actually that adding to forcing people out of the area. Uh, we want people, you know, we want the transportation, we need the transportation, but we can't continue, we can't overtax people or they're gonna just force more people out of the area. Uh, but as far as the success of the homelessness, um, obviously to, you know, see fewer people on the streets, see, fewer, see more people in treatment programs and, and help with more successful outcomes. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, does anyone else have uh, any questions you want to ask? Yeah, I've got one that we've editorialized on a, on a few occasions, uh, concerns that we have had when Metro has uh, kind of gone out of its lane, if you will, um, the housing bond, this homelessness uh, bond, but, but struggling to, to succeed in all areas and yet still expanding into others. Do you have concerns about that with Metro and what would you do on the council to try to rein that in and, and focus this massive agency on those things it does best? And who, where are we, Helen, in terms of? I think Patricia goes first this time. Patricia, great, thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, somebody walked in and distracted me. Could you repeat the question? Oh, sure. I was just curious, in, in various editorials in the past, we have raised the question of whether Metro, or and we have thought Metro has been uh, going out of its uh, with the, uh, now with the um, homelessness measure. And so I'm just curious if you have these same concerns about this fairly massive uh, municipality and what would you do, or uh, government agency, what would you do to try and um, address that if you do have concerns? Okay. Actually, you know, I, I honestly don't think, I, I'd like to see Metro more involved. I think that they've been given certain over, overseeing powers, you know, they're supposed to be overseeing transportation, There's, um, but I think that honestly, uh, TriMet has not been uh, supervised enough um, as far as providing services, affordable services for the community. Um, and um, I think really need to, you know, I think they really need to be we have, I mean, when we talk about that transportation measure that's coming up, one of the big issues is um, get out into these outlying areas where people are being forced. Um, and I mean, beyond expanding further out, the areas that we have, the infrastructure has not been maintained. The areas with no side people that are trying to take transportation are being led off on the side of, let's say, for example, where there's no sidewalk, and then they're getting hit by vehicles. I mean, we've had, as, you know, as you know, record-breaking pedestrian deaths, which was screaming help with the coronavirus. But um, <laughs> the, uh, it, it's it's very frustrating that things continue to happen, and there's been nobody taking a strong step to resolve the problem. And I think that is a role that Metro should be playing. And Tom? Well, I think Metro has overextended itself. Um, now they are known as the Regional Taxing Authority for Portland. And I'm sure the state loves that because Grants Pass and Metro don't whine to them about a state uh, measure that is only gonna affect the, the Portland area. However, um, it's very problematic. When the, when the housing authorities came to um, to Metro the first time for the housing bond, I think they were all in agreement and it was pretty well done. But, but then this last one um, with the mental health services, um, I think they got blackmailed a little bit. It was either you put this on the ballot or we're gonna get a referendum and put it on the ballot anyway. 
So under, under the auspices of Metro's taxing authority. So I think it does need to be reined in. I think the state could actually step in and say, hey, no new taxes uh, unless it's part of a state situation. Um, obviously, uh, they do parks well, they do the convention center well, they do um, the zoo and, and of course the, the um, solid waste. They do those things very well. I, I would like to have Metro continue to do those. those there will be things that will pop up um, besides transportation, the 5G um, rollout that's coming. Um, a lot of the cities are expecting uh, big expenses on that. I, Metro might play a role in that. Uh, Lynn Peterson said, uh, President of the Council said that there really or anything is, uh, everything is on the table. Nothing is off the table as far as Metro goes, as far as the taxing authority. So that concerns me. What would I do on council? Well, you just gotta fight back a little bit and uh, try to represent, you know, your district. And my district is uh, feeling a little tax fatigue. Ellen, I have to jump off uh, for the afternoon news meeting. So thank you candidates for your time. Sure. Thank you. And actually, I think I'm pretty much all set. Do, you, or do any of the others have any more questions that they want to jump in on? Oh, Laura actually asked the same question I was going to ask. So oh, I'm all sorry. <laughs> no, no, no worries. <laughs> Great. Um, I think uh, do um, you're welcome to take a, a, a minute to kind of summarize or, you know, again, kind of argue for, you know, what uh, your candidacy would mean for the council versus your opponent. Um, if you like, I think, I can't remember, uh, I guess why don't we start with Tom since uh, you went first the first time and then this will give Patricia the last word. Sure, well I would like your support, um, you know, and I'd uh, like to thank Patricia for running. It's not easy to run for a, a public office and uh, so we're both putting it out there. But I think I'm experienced enough. I've got the uh, qualifications and I know the city leaders uh, enough that uh, give them some comfort that they will uh, be represented in, from my district, uh, District 3. And um, I think Metro needs a little pushback. I can't say that uh, it hasn't happened in the, in the past. I haven't been in those rooms. But um, as we go forward, I, I would like to represent District 3. And Patricia, thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I am asking for your support. Um, and as a member of the community, I'm not, you know, I, I mean, I've been an advocate for years, working on committees which between the city, the state, uh, county, um, for different services that was that were much needed in the community. And um, a lot of, you know, when it gets up to the council level, they tend to get rejected and overlooked. And I think they really need a voice at Metro to, to be there to speak for those people that are being overlooked and marginalized and make sure they're not set aside. And that's why I'm running. Um, so thank you very much for listening to me today. Thanks very much. We appreciate your time. Um, we'll be coming out with our endorsements uh, towards the end of the month or beginning of May. Um, but again, thank you so much. We really appreciate the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you for taking your time out. It's so good to meet you through Zoom. Yes. Yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.